Hello, Darren Alf here from BicycleTrainPro.com and today is the first day of my Northern California Redwoods Bicycle Tour. I'm in Eureka, California right now. I actually arrived here late last night. I drove up from Southern California, did a quick tour of the old town, and then uh, I drove across town to Dick and Kathy's house. Dick and Kathy are warm showers hosts that I wrote to before I came up here and I asked them if I could park my van at their house for the week that I'm away on this bike tour. So um, had dinner with them last night and then slept in my van last night and this morning woke up, had breakfast, Dick showed me around his property. He's got a six acre property here in Eureka, showed me around. He's got a really cool barn, two houses that he built himself. It didn't, didn't work out because, well, we just got two and I mean, I didn't realize that building a house would take five years. Yeah. And then we started, we had some kids and then they started going, you know, you sort of got into the community and into the activities. But you wanted to build a boat? Yeah, my my first wife was a um, boat person. Like a sailboat, or yeah, yeah like uh. a sailboat. So this would be big enough to do it here. Yeah. But I started building a house and realized that building a boat would be a lot worse. <laughs> I think so. He's got orchards and bees that he keeps and all kinds of cool stuff. Really, really neat. Okay, so come around here. Okay. And uh, this top box is empty. Here's, uh, see I had two cakes of sugar in there. You can see they're pretty quiet. Yeah, they look like they're sleeping. Yeah, they're just being, you know, they're a little cool, but they're warm enough that they can, uh, if you put your hand here, it's not that cold in there. Uh, they, do, they do generate heat. How many bees do you think are actually in there? This one? This one's probably 20,000, 20,000. In that one box? Well, that's the top, this fifth box, there's two more boxes yeah. below. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they, they range like 15,000 in the winter up to like 50 or 60,000 in the, in the summer. Wow. They, they change, they, you know, no point having extra mouths to feed them. So, just, so just here you might have 200,000 bees or something. Oh yeah. Okay, so here's a, Here's an experiment of whether they like sugar water, take sugar water faster than sugar cake. Seems the sugar cake is winning. Yeah. Well, I'll have to weigh it, see and see. Yeah. Um. So after that, and after getting my bike packed up, I am now out on the road with my bike and I'm heading north up the coast today. Here we go. I've been driving all night long to the place where I belong. Back to where I started from The only place that I call home Seventeen around the bend Drinking with my old best friend Listening to the radio I thought we'd stay until the end It wasn't always right But it wasn't all that bad This was all I thought they would have changed the name by now The owner, someone as anyhow That's where I saw Jenny first Then I think I almost burst I heard that she's a doctor now She got out of this place
all we All right, I did it. Just completed my first day of my Northern California Redwood bike tour. Um, what you might not know is that this is not my first time in this particular part of the world. In fact, my very first bike tour that I ever did at age 17 started in Eureka, California, which is where I began this morning. I thought, because I am in Eureka again, and it's been a very, very long time since I did my first bike tour at age 17, that was 17, 18 years ago, um, I thought I would kind of tell the story of my very first bike tour and how that went. Like I said, I was 17 years old, I had just graduated from high school and I wanted to do something kind of big and challenging before I went off uh, to university and I saw a bike tour as a way of kind of testing myself on my own for the very first time. And uh, yeah, so I, I told my parents that I wanted to do this bike trip from Eureka, California all the way to Mexico and they were relatively okay with the idea, but they wanted someone to go with me. They didn't want me to do it all by myself. And that's understandable. So I reached out to a bunch of my friends and my friend Jason Weber volunteered to come with me from Eureka, California down to San Francisco. And then I had other friends join me on other parts of the trip. But uh, my friend Jason joined me from Eureka, California to San Francisco. So for months, before our bike tour began, we were planning this trip. Basically, I was planning the trip and Jason was tagging along. And one of the problems with having Jason come was that he didn't have a bicycle. So not only was I preparing my bicycle, but I was also preparing a second bicycle for Jason. So as a poor 17 year old, I was buying all this equipment, not just for one bike, but for two. And then I had two bikes all set to go and the night before the trip began, Jason basically like called me and said, dude, I can't do it, I don't have any money, I, I can't go on the trip. And I don't know exactly what happened. I think I called his mom and said, Jason's coming with me, tell him that he's coming with me. I'll pay, if he has to, you know, if he runs out of money or something, I'll, I'll pay for it and he can pay me back. It's not a big deal. So that's what happened is he almost bailed on me the night before the trip began. Um, and then I ended up paying for things a little bit on the trip um, just to help him out financially or whatever. But that's how I got him to come at all. So we took a Greyhound bus all the way up to Eureka and we got off the bus at like 6 a.m. It was freezing cold. Um, it was just about to get light and there were a bunch of like homeless people loitering around and, and it felt very, very scary actually. And when I was back in Eureka just yesterday, um, the, the problem is exactly the same. There's still like a lot of homeless people just loitering around the city. So anyways, um, we had these two bicycles in cardboard boxes and we had to get them out of the boxes, put everything together, load all the bikes up. And this was the first time that either one of us had ever loaded our two bicycles that we were gonna ride all the way down the coast. So once we got these things loaded, well, first of all, we dumped the cardboard boxes that we shipped everything in. There was a dumpster near the bus station and I threw the boxes in there. And when I looked in, the entire dumpster was filled with X-rated magazines, like Penthouse and Playboy and things like that, and worse. So I grabbed the cover off of one of these magazines and kind of stuck it onto the back of Jason's bike without him seeing me do it. And he rode for about a mile with a naked lady on the back of his bike. But that's how we began our bike tour. And one of the things that I do remember most about the start of our trip is that because we had never actually loaded the bicycles up with food and all the stuff that we were actually going to be carrying with us on our trip, when we first started cycling, we were like weaving like this. We couldn't keep the bicycles straight because when you ride a bicycle that's loaded down with gear, it's very different than riding an unloaded regular bicycle. So we were really struggling for the first several miles and and I was thinking like, there's no way that I can ride this bike all the way to Mexico. Luckily, you do get used to riding with weight after a while, but that is something that pretty much every person that's new to bicycle touring um, has to go through. And we went through it as well. 
But um, big tip there, if you are new to bike training, make sure you pack up your bike before you leave home. Um, that'll help you a lot. Anyways, um, our first day on the road, I should talk about that because today was my first day on the road here. And I don't remember a whole lot from the actual first day of the trip. What I do remember, however, is getting to the campsite and being absolutely exhausted. Like I had never ridden that far in my life. We rode 60 miles on the first day of the trip, which was the farthest I had ever ridden in my entire life, Jason too. And we were beat. Like we set up our tents and we were gone. Like we passed out. We didn't even eat. We just put the tents up, laid down, boom, done. And what I do remember is waking up the following morning and it felt as though my legs, like my quads, had doubled in size because I was using all these muscles that I had never used before. And it takes quite a bit of uh, oomph to push a loaded touring bicycle up hills and down the road and that sort of a thing. So that's what I remember from the very first day of my 2001 bike tour down the California coastline with my friend Jason. Now, 2018, here I am back again and the riding today was a little bit easier <laughs> than it was back in 2001. I've got quite a bit of experience behind me and um, today was really a nice, nice ride. I stopped a lot, took photos, took video, and um, it was windy and cold for a lot of the ride, but overall, relatively comfortable. So now I'm at Patrick Point State Park. I paid $5 uh, for a campsite here, and I might take a shower tonight. Um, until it gets dark, I'm just gonna walk around and kind of explore a little bit, then I'll make my way back to the campsite, cook up some food, and call it an evening. Darren Alf here from BicycleTrainPro.com. Today is day two of my bike tour through Northern California and the giant redwoods that are here along the coast. I am at Patrick's Point State Park and behind me is the Sumac Village. The Sumacs were Native Americans that used to live in this area and they constructed their homes out of the redwood trees. So these buildings that you see behind me are made from planks of the redwoods. So today is day two of the trip. I have a 20 mile bike ride up the coast and then I'm going to be headed into the mountains which is where the redwoods should get really, really thick. Here we go, day two. All right, so I'm back on the road. I got about a half mile to go and then I hit the 101 freeway. And I think most of the ride today, for the first half at least, is going to be on the Highway 101. So I'm not sure if it's going to be quite as scenic as yesterday, but we'll see. Onto the freeway.
where we go uphill. Seriously steep climbing now for a while. So while I was going up that hill there, I got passed by a sheriff's vehicle and he spun around, turned turned around, came up behind me and I stopped and he basically was just asking like where I was going, what I was doing, where I was going to stay tonight, things like that. And I told him my route and he suggested some places that I could camp tonight. Um, one of which is like 17 miles up the road. But he basically said like be careful because the people up here are a little and they might, uh, you know, give you some problems. So warning, be careful. And then just now I, I stopped for a second because I found this knife on the side of the ground and um, here it is. But it's locking mechanism is broken. So that's probably why someone chucked it, but free knife, it, it would work. I'm just gonna leave it like next to the signpost here beside me. Um, maybe someone else wants it. I don't wanna carry it, but uh, Anyways, that was my chat with the sheriff and the free knife. I realize this road doesn't look that steep on camera, but let me tell you, this is one of the steepest roads I've cycled in a long time. Holy crap, I'm so tired. When I'm talking to camera, you know it's gotten less steep. I can't talk and climb super steep stuff at the same time. I'm still going uphill at the moment, but it's evened out a little bit. <sighs> A big uh, logging truck just pulled over, stopped, and said that he just saw a bear right up the road here. So he was giving me a warning. I'm a little afraid now, so I'm trying to make some noise. <laughs> and I'm definitely keeping my eyes peeled here. That's a little scary. He didn't say how big the bear was. That's good information to know. As a bicycle tourist, I have several fears, the biggest of which is just getting hit by a car. But a close second, I would say, is seeing a bear while I'm on my tour. And I really don't want to see one up close. Like from a Super far distance, that would be good. But yeah, I don't want to see one when I'm all by myself up here. And totally exposed on my bicycle. That's the bad thing about a bike versus a car in certain situations like this is I just have no protection. And you can't outrun a bear on a bicycle. And did I mention they have mountain lions up here also? And several 
of them were spotted recently at the campground that I stayed at last night. So they are definitely active in the area here. I am so hungry right now, you would not believe it. I'm gonna cook up some rice and make a salad. That's gonna be my dinner for tonight. Otherwise, I'm just gonna sit here and enjoy the view until the sun sets. And then after that, I'll climb inside my tent and try not to think about bears. Good morning, Darren Alf here from BicycleTouringPro.com. It's day three of my bike tour here in Northern California through the redwood trees. Yesterday, um, I was stopped by a sheriff who told me to watch out for the people around here. That kind of scared me a little bit. Then I was stopped by a guy in a logging truck and he said, I just saw a bear, so you might want to be careful. And so after that happened, I was pretty scared for the rest of the day and I made sure to uh, pick a campsite tonight that was kind of in a non-wooded area. I didn't want to be in the deep dark forest last night. I was pretty scared. Now it got me thinking that both of those people were trying to help me, but in the grand scheme of things and in reality, all they ended up doing was kind of scaring me. Um, I was aware that I needed to be watching out for people in general, and I was also aware that there were bears in the area. But um, just being told those two things in rapid succession um, made it a little scary last night. I, I didn't sleep like super great, and I woke up uh, a little earlier than I would have liked to. But the sun is out, um, it looks like a good day. I'm up above the clouds, which is really uh, nice, very scenic, but I have a, still a big, big climb today. I've got about 20 more miles of uphill climbing, and then it should be downhill into the city of Hoopa, California.
so I'm back on the road, back on my bicycle. I feel really tired. I don't think I ate enough last night. I just feel like I'm at 40% starting the day out. Didn't get enough sleep, didn't eat enough food. While I've got you here, and I'm going up a small hill, I thought I would talk for a moment about the three-day hump. It's something I talk about a lot as the Bicycle Train Pro when I teach people how to conduct their own bike tours, letting them know what to expect along the way. And one of the most challenging things about bicycle touring occurs in the first three days on the road. In fact, the first three days are usually the hardest days of any bicycle tour. And I like to remind people of this because so many people quit their bike tours during the first three days because they're tired and sore, hungry and thirsty, and, and they aren't sure if they're going to be able to continue like this for the entire duration of their trip. But something happens after day three, usually, where you start to get in the groove of things and feel better. And so today is day three for me. And even though I'm an experienced bicycle tourist, I still experience that three-day hump when I'm out on a bike tour like this because I've been off the bike for a little bit. And so I'm starting, starting anew now with this new bike tour. And there have been moments in the last two days where I thought, why am I doing this to myself? This isn't fun. I want to go home. I just want to sit on the couch and eat some ice cream and watch a movie. But um, I have to keep reminding myself that I, I do know it becomes easier if you just keep going. So that's what I'm doing today. Just getting over that three day hump. Lots of snow here. Getting up near the top of the mountain. Whew. I am out of breath. I hope the top of this mountain is close because I am really tired. Whew.
I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe I've reached the top of the hill. Man, this thing just kept going and going. Short downhill now. Come, got some switchbacks uh, to go down. I'm looking forward to it. So I made it down the hill across the bridge. I'm now on an Indian reservation, Native American uh, Indian reservation. And I'm not sure what the name of it is, but according to my map, it's three more miles to the supermarket. What kind of supermarket it is, I don't know. Might be really small, but I'm gonna load up on food there. I am so hungry. Last year at about this time, I was finishing up a three month long bike tour across Ecuador and Colombia in South America. And I spent most of my time cycling across the Amazon rainforest. And this stretch of road, for whatever reason, reminds me a lot of the Amazon in many ways. Some areas not so much, but some areas, yeah, quite a bit of waterfalls and jungles. It's really cool. Okay. So I wanted to make it to the city of Hoopa, which is on a Native American reservation. Um, unfortunately, the road was closed and there was like a hundred cars waiting to get through and I just didn't want to wait. Um, it was still about an hour away on the bicycle, maybe a little bit more, hour and a half, and it's already five o'clock at night, so I just figured, ah, why push it for another hour, hour and a half, get there like right when it's getting dark, still not know where I'm gonna sleep and all that, so I just said, screw it I got some things at like the gas station um, supermarket and I'm just gonna camp here for tonight behind me this is like the town dump I don't know where I am right now but it's like a dumping ground at the very least so I need to be a little stealthy because I'm camping here so I'm just gonna quietly go about setting up my tent and making myself some food So I have camp set up here. I'm gonna cook some dinner. I got stuff uh, at the gas station for nachos, chips, salsa, beans, little cheese, that's it. I couldn't find any veggies at the gas station, but um, that's gonna be my dinner for tonight. While we're talking about Mexican food, which is one of my favorite foods, by the way, if you didn't know, um, <laughs> one of the things that I was surprised by on, on some of my early bike tours when I started traveling internationally is the fact that in many other countries in the world, the food is not very diverse. A lot of times the people eat the same thing every day, every day, every day. And I grew up in Southern California where the culture is really diverse. There's a mix of people from all around the world. And because of that, there's a mix of foods from all around the world. And I just grew up thinking that everywhere in the world was like that, when in reality it's not. Um, for example, I spent two months living in Taiwan and ate Chinese food pretty much every single day. And some longtime followers of Bicycle Touring Pro might know that I complained about the food when I was in Lyon, Spain, because all I could find was tapas and beer. And there didn't seem to be any other restaurants around. 
and I actually found a Mexican restaurant that was there and this Mexican restaurant didn't even have beans or rice, which is like, that's the basic principle of Mexican food. So if you don't have either one of those things, it's not Mexican. Um, and, and lastly, like I went to Peru, I spent six months, almost six months, traveling in Peru and I thought, oh, Peru, it's South American, it's similar to Mexico in a lot of ways, same language, um, they're surely gonna have Mexican food. Nope, nope, totally different foods. Uh, <laughs> couldn't find beans or rice practically anywhere. So, um, I don't know where I'm going with this, I just think it's, a, it's an interesting thing um, to think about um, because I, I think it's so strange that like, like in Taiwan, every day people go out for the same meal essentially it's like chinese food or chinese food today um, whereas here in southern california i grew up like what do you want chinese italian mexican korean everything you know what i mean that like you just bounce around between all these different dishes and i can't imagine a life where i was eating the same thing over and over and over again and the, and the really weird thing to me too is like i i spent several months traveling in Sweden, Finland, and Norway this last summer, um, and they have a big Mexican food section at the supermarkets there. And what's funny is in Spain, which is in Europe as well, and is a country where they actually speak Spanish like they do in Mexico, um, they don't have Mexican food. <laughs> not really. I, I mean, I'm sure they do somewhere, but not like on a broad scale or not at the su supermarket that I could tell at least. So, um, yeah, just really weird to me how like, why does Sweden have Mexican food and Spain doesn't? That makes no, no sense whatsoever. <laughs> but anyways, all right, that's my little rant for tonight. It was a good day of bike touring and uh, I'm gonna dig in tonight. I didn't eat enough food yesterday, so I, I was feeling sluggish the first half of today. Um, definitely gonna uh, eat a lot tonight. <laughs> I don't know what that was. So I'm on the road now and I just passed a sign saying that there's a roadblock road construction up here and they're stopping cars for as long as an hour. So I could be stuck here for quite some time before I get through on this road. And I'm very grateful that today I'm not planning to cycle very far. So we'll see if I get lucky and hit this at the right time or if I get stuck. like we're moving. Yes, I hit this at like the perfect time. All right, I made it through the construction area. I wasn't able to videotape because it was really bumpy and lots going on. But uh, it wasn't very long, it was pretty short. I got through with no problems. This is a nice road, there's hardly anyone out. 
one car passing me every 10 minutes or so. Really nice. Whew. one of these in a long time. Let's see if this works. Ugh. I press the button. Yep, the lights are flashing. Okay. Here we go. I press the button back there to let the cars know that there's a biker on the road. That's kind of nice. So this road that I'm cycling on right now is called the Bigfoot Scenic Byway. And this is the part of the world where Bigfoot is most commonly known to live, I guess. <laughs> There's more Bigfoot sightings in this part of the world than anywhere else. And after spending some time here, I can see why. The forests are just deep and dark and scary. Um, when I was in sixth grade, I, I remember doing a school report about Bigfoot and I watched like every documentary that had ever been done on Bigfoot at the time and there's been a whole lot more since. But um, that really scared me for several years afterwards of going into the woods, especially by myself. Of course now I've spent years and years of my life camping by myself in the deep, dark, scary woods. So you'd think I'd be used to it. But it's still a little scary to think about sometimes that there are bears and mountain lions and potentially unknown animals living in the woods. Whew. Now that I'm out of town here, the road's going uphill, but it's nice in the shade and scenic. On this plaque behind me, it says that down here is a cast of a Bigfoot footprint. And, you, and it says to compare your foot to the size of the Bigfoot track. So I'm gonna do that now. So on the left is the Bigfoot track that was supposedly found nearby here. And this is my footprint, which is, well, my feet are size 12. I think it's 46 otherwise, but yeah, size 12 US. So I made it to Willow Creek. I'm just gonna lock my bike up here, go inside and get two days worth of food to carry with me up this hill. We're in the final stretch here. So I went to the supermarket and filled up my bags with a bunch of food, hopefully enough, to get me through the next couple of days. I also went to Subway Sandwich, <laughs> which I never eat at. That's the thing about bicycle touring, like you are forced to kind of eat foods that you would normally not otherwise eat. And Subway is one of those things for me. I never eat it when I'm at home, but I do occasionally eat it out on the road. And today is one of those days. So I'm gonna eat this whole thing before I start cycling up the mountain. Now supposedly there's a campground about two miles up the road and I'm hoping to stay there tonight. So hopefully it's open. Hopefully they have hiker biker sites so I don't have to pay a fortune just to stay there for the evening. We'll see. So just gonna eat this sandwich and then I'll be on my way.
So, two days ago I was climbing a big hill and yesterday I got to the bottom of that hill and was cycling now in this valley along the Bigfoot Scenic Byway. Well now, to get back to Eureka, I gotta go back over this hill again. So, so now that's what I'm doing is going back up into the mountains and I'll basically be climbing for the next day or so. Um, it's 45 miles back to Eureka, all uphill. <laughs> well, I made it to the Boise Creek campground, which is where I was planning to stay tonight. And of course, the place is closed. Um, behind me here, that is the gate. I crossed over the gate saying, don't come in here, basically. Came in anyways. I just wanted to read the board. It's $10 to camp here normally, but the gate's closed and I don't know why. Um, there's no one here and I'm kind of thinking of just camping here to be honest, but I don't really want to get in trouble with the National Park Service, so I'm trying to figure out what to do. The problem is if I keep going up the road, it's really, really steep and there might not be anywhere else to camp just in the forest or whatever. So I'm kind of thinking of just looking around here and seeing if I can maybe camp somewhere close by but just outside of the campground. Water station. Looks like a nice campground. I hate it when there's a campground and it's closed. Like, what's the point of it? When is it open? I don't get it. It's sunny today. It's not like it's snow covered or anything. Why can't I camp here? Ugh. Frustrating. This is what I like so much about my bike tour last summer where I was biking across Sweden, Finland, and Norway. They have places like this everywhere and they're totally free and there's no sign saying don't camp here, blah 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 blah, 100 rules, etc. They're like encouraging you to come out and camp and make a fire and spend time outdoors and go fishing. I don't get why we can't do that here. Well, I, I kind of do. I mean, we have more people. Okay, fine. But geez louise. I just hate it. It's frustrating. <sighs> Makes me mad. So now that I've got you here, I've got my camp all set up and I just finished cycling the Bigfoot Scenic Byway here in Northern California. I thought this would be a good time for me to talk about things that go bump in the night. So a lot of people ask me if I've ever had animals or even people come up to my tent during the middle of the night and try to bother me or, or get inside my tent or something like that, attack me or whatever. Um, and the truth is, no, I've never had a person come up to my tent, but I have had animals come right up to my tent. And in fact, I, I forget what year it was, 2014, I believe, I was cycling across northern Poland. And I was in an area where I knew that there were wild boar. You could see the, the boars dig down into the ground and they make a mess of the whole ground. So I could see that there were boars nearby, um, but I was in my tent and for whatever reason, I, um, I hid all of my food outside of the tent because I knew that these boars were around. I hung it up in a tree or whatever. But there was this one stray uh, thing of cheese that I left in one of my bags and I only found it right before I was gonna go to sleep. So um, instead of getting out of my tent and 
bringing the bag down and putting the cheese in the bag and then going back inside my tent. I was too lazy and I just put the cheese outside my tent like under the rain fly and on top of all my other stuff. And during the middle of the night I could hear a very large animal slowly approaching my tent and and I was fully awake at this point you know wondering what is out there because you're inside your tent it's pitch black you can't see anything and um, I mean I could see you know a few inches in front of me inside the tent and that was about it but anyway so I'm, I'm sitting there very very quiet it gets really like the the calm before the storm and all of a sudden the rain fly on my tent lifts up just a little bit and I can see a wild boar's nose uh, basically inside the rain fly of my tent, just about a foot or two away from me. It grabbed the cheese right off the top of my bag and then went running away and I could hear it running off in the distance and I actually, it actually grabbed the cheese and like another little plastic bag that I had next to it. And so in the morning I found the plastic bag way far away from my tent, um, but the cheese was long gone. So that's probably the closest and scariest thing that has ever happened to me um, while I'm camping in my tent. I've had other incidences, not while I was camping necessarily, like uh, 2003, I was biking from North Carolina to Maine up the east coast of the United States, and I was cycling in uh, the state of Virginia. In fact, I had just crossed the border from North Carolina to Virginia, and I was cycling through kind of a remote farmland area, and it was a dirt road. And I came around the bend, like a left-hand turn around this bend, and off to my left-hand side, just off, it was like a wooded area, very similar to this. Just off to my left, I saw what I thought at first was a big golden dog, like a, a golden retriever or something like that. You know, you're cycling, you look over, there's a big animal over there. And I was in Virginia, I assumed it was a dog but I scared the animal, whatever it was, and it jumped up and started running. It just happened to be running in the same direction as my bike, so it was running parallel to me about 10 feet away. And once it started running, I saw that the tail on this thing was about, oh, three feet long. <laughs> it was huge. And that's when I realized that this wasn't a dog, this was a mountain lion, and I was looking it straight in the face. Um, it immediately kind of took off to its left and I went to the right and uh, it disappeared very, very quickly in the trees. That thing was fast. But um, that is by far the scariest thing that's ever happened to me on any of my bike tours was that run in with the mountain lion. Um, other times I've had like deer come up to my tent. That's not scary. I've had uh, raccoons, which can be actually scary. I've had like three raccoons come up to my tent at nighttime all at once and trying to get in my tent. I had food in there um, at the time. Uh, what else? Um, in Africa one time uh, I was out in, I don't know where I was, I was out in the middle of nowhere, that's where I was. And I was in my tent and it was early morning and I could hear growling outside my tent like <laughs> like that and I, and of course I'm in Africa I'm thinking lions hyenas what could that be you know and and when you're in a tent there's no windows so you can't really see what's going on and and so I'm like trying to be quiet because I don't want to draw any attention to myself undo the zipper and I finally peek out and what it was was these giant antelope like a, a there's, there's a whole bunch of different types of antelope, right? This was a big antelope. I don't know what it was exactly, but I guess when it saw me, I scared it and it started making these growling noises, which were very, very similar to what you might expect to hear from, from a lion. So um, yeah, those are just some of the scary moments that have happened to me on my bike tours. But I honestly think that if I were ever to see a Bigfoot or what people describe as a Bigfoot, even if it was just a bear that I thought looked like Bigfoot, um, I would like seriously be so scared. It's like my biggest fear out here um, on my bike tours is like seeing Bigfoot. Um, like there are people that die from shock and I think that's what would happen to me <laughs> if I ever saw Bigfoot in real life.
Anyways, that's it guys. Thanks for watching my video today. Stay tuned for the next one and I hope to see you out on the road sometime soon. Bye. Darren Alf here from Bicycle Touring Pro. It is day five of my mini bike tour here in Northern California. I'm back out on the bicycle, cycling west on the 299 highway. There's not much traffic today, which is nice. And uh, I'm going uphill. It's a doozy. <laughs> The weather right now is one of those things where I'm not sure if I should take my jacket off or leave it on. It's, it's a little chilly, but I'm going uphill, so I'm hot, and I don't know what to do. I'm kind of in between. I didn't sleep super great last night. I kept waking up a whole bunch. I was in the dream state. I was having all kinds of weird dreams. I don't remember what they were, but one of them, the only one I do remember is a dream where I got bitten in the hand by a snake and I couldn't get the snake off of me. And when I woke up, I was sleeping on my hand. So I moved my hand, went back to sleep, had some other dream. But uh, yeah, I didn't sleep super great last night, even though my camping spot was pretty darn great. Just made it to the top of this hill. I think it's the top. Ah, yeah. Elevation 2,803 feet. I came up from 200 feet elevation, so I just climbed 2,600 feet uphill. So I've been on this alternative road for a little while now and it's been nice. Only two cars passed me. Um, but I'm having to go up some switchbacks at the moment and I'm gonna have to get back on the highway in just a second. So I'm trying to enjoy this last little bit while I can. So some time has passed now, it's almost five o'clock, or it's actually a little after five o'clock. Um, I was planning to camp at the top of the hill and I reached the top, um, but the road that I was planning to camp on was closed, it's private property. 
And so I just figured, oh, I'll go down the mountain, find another place. But I just kept going and going and going and going. I couldn't find anywhere to camp. And now I'm only 17 miles from uh, Dick and Kathy's house. Dick and Kathy are the ones that are watching my van. And, and so I just figured, hey, it's five o'clock. It gets dark at seven. I got two hours to cycle 17 miles, which should be okay. As long as this wind, the headwind I'm fighting right now, doesn't get too much stronger. <sighs> so I'm just gonna put my head down and pedal and try to get there before nightfall. So I just about made it back here. It's getting dark pretty soon. Um, I emailed Dick and Kathy to let them know I was coming early and they said that they're going out to dinner with some friends so they they left the door open for me. I don't know if um, they're gonna be home or not but uh, if they aren't I, I can get in and take a shower, get some food, stuff like that. So. That was really nice of them. So, here's my car where I left it all week. My bike is back here. I'm just gonna uh, load my bike and my things into the van, grab some clean clothes out of here, and then go into the house and take a shower. That'll be the end of my trip here. I didn't get your name last time. I don't know what your name is. All right guys, so that was the video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you wanna help me continue to make more videos like this one for the Bicycle Touring Pro YouTube channel, there are three things that you can do right now to really help me out. So number one, the first thing, tell your friends, family members, coworkers, and loved ones about Bicycle Touring Pro. If you know somebody that would enjoy this video, please share it with them. That would really mean a lot to me. Second of all, buy a copy of my book, The Bicycle Touring Blueprint. This is my 400 page guide that teaches you how to go bicycle touring anywhere in the world. So when you buy the book, you're not only helping yourself learn how to bike tour, but you're also helping Bicycle Touring Pro fund the website and these videos and the podcast and everything that I do as the Bicycle Touring Pro. Finally, if you really wanna help me out, consider making a financial donation using the link in the video description down below. The website address is bicycleturingpro.com forward slash donate. Any donation of any size really goes a long way towards helping me continue to fund the videos that you see here on the Bicycle Touring Pro YouTube channel. So those are three things right now that you can do to help me make more videos in the future. And if you do any of those three, I would really, really appreciate it. Once again, guys, I am Darren Al from BicycleTrainPro.com. Thank you so much for watching, commenting, and sharing my videos. And I hope to see you out on the road sometime soon. Bye guys, bye. Bye.